and we are back. And we're showing you animals from land, sea and air today. All this, the very best of Cornish wildlife on episode two of Nature, Nature Watch. Divers from across the UK flock to Cornwall in order to experience the amazing coastlines. But there's one spot in particular on the east coast of the Lizard Point, whose hotspot has become the centre of University of Exeter research. Welcome to Porth Keras and the Manacles. up with Sea Search's National Coordinator Chris Wood on the beach before the dive. Can you tell us a bit about what Sea Search are involved with, with the research and what you guys do? Sea Search has been going for over 20 years now and it's a volunteer citizen science project for divers. We organise dives all around the country, um, some of them are targeted at specific things and one of the things we've targeted is pink sea fans. A pink sea fan is a type of coral called a Gorgonian coral and we've only got two types in the whole of the United Kingdom. And they are a protected species and have been since 1981. So we wanted to record where they were occurring through sea search. Sea search has been collecting data at the manacles for over 10 years, measuring the size, growth rate and condition of the delicate sea fan. What's the, what's the sign of a good condition or a bad, bad condition of a uh, sea fan colony? Well, the, the sea fans, when they're alive and pink, um, and they're, they're normally in a, in a fan shape because they, they're across the current, so the current wafts past and brings food to them. Amazed by the variety of life, I asked what was threatening the pink sea fans. They're an animal that stands proud of the seabed, generally on hard substrate, and the most damaging thing to them is water quality, but probably more directly is bottom trawled fishing gear, so scallop dredging, beam trawling or otter trawling, and they will rip pink sea fans off the seabed. Sea fans take 30 to 40 years to be fully grown if they are undamaged by beam trawling or anchors. They are often the home to other creatures such as sea slugs and provide anchorage for dogfish eggs. After about 30 minutes in the water, Chris and his team were out of air and we headed back to the shore. What's there to stop uh, scout trawling? And the Manacles is a new designation called a Marine Conservation Zone that's just been designated in the last couple of years. And we've been diving there to ground truth exactly where the animals are and where they might be threatened from these sorts of activities. At the moment, the Manacles is in pretty good condition, which is exciting. But if you were to scallop dredge it, if you were to put a lot of heavy equipment over the reefs, you will abrade those animals and kill them. Cornwall is extremely biodiverse, particularly with its marine life. In summer we get plankton blooms, jellyfish, basking sharks and leatherback turtles. But that stuff won't remain there unless we protect it. Exactly, and that's why organisations like SeaSearch are so important because they're the ones that provide the protection for some of the least well-known species like pink sea fans. Now, conserving marine life can be tricky. For many, it's a case of out of sight, out of mind. But in the past, we haven't been any better with what we've got on the land, and that includes some of Britain's most beautiful mammalian carnivores. But some of them are starting to make a comeback. And recently, myself and Ethan went to visit some of them very up close. We're here today at Upcott Grange Farm, a place close to my heart and home to the Derek Gow Consultancy and the West Country Wildlife Photography Centre. Now as the name suggests, 
This farm isn't home to your usual cows, pigs and chickens. So you may be wondering what exactly it has here. Well, let us go get the food and we'll show you around. Right, so in here, Ethan, uh, we have two otters. Uh, have, you seen, have you actually seen an otter in the wild? Uh, I've never seen one in the wild. No. Well, what you said is reflects most people. They are just so elusive. Um, and unless you go to the west coast of Scotland, um, there's some rivers as well in the south of England where they have come accustomed to people. Uh, but otherwise, you know, they just won't see them. Uh, but you know, they are the apex predator of our waterways, essentially, you know. Yeah. Herons, water voles, dragonflies, they're all below the otter. He is the king. Yeah. Um, and they were very common. Uh, I don't know much about how the otters declined um, some years ago. Uh, this is an agricultural chemical they used. Um, and it basically ploughed it into the farmlands and it ran straight off into the rivers. Um, and it didn't necessarily kill the otters directly, but it built up in the food chain. So it bioaccumulated mm. uh, through the ecosystem. So it got to the point the otters were eating these very heavily poisoned fish. And they're actually going infertile as a result. Okay, so um, how many populations do we have in Cornwall at the moment? Uh, well, Cornwall, pretty much every river will have otters on it. Wow. Um, you know, if you walk down the riverbank, uh, and you find otter sprain, otter sprain is glorious. <laughs> it is literally, you know, the symbol of modern conservation there in a packet of poo. Uh, not only is, you know, because that was otter sprain, so that's how we found out they were coming back. Yeah. You know, all these rivers where they went extinct, suddenly you're walking out there and finding spots of otter sprain, and it's a signal that the otter has returned. Nature is back. All right, welcome to the wildcats den. These were essentially confined anywhere north of um, the Galloway Forest. Um, so around Perthshire, into the Cairngorms and beyond. Um, but again, these are an animal that should be all over the UK. Now we call them the Scottish wildcat, but they should be just the wildcat. You know, they are the European wildcat. Um, and we have, you know, taken them out in huge numbers in the um, early 19th century. Uh, but the trouble these guys face is that, you know, we obviously like our domestic cats. But they're going to get along quite well. Um, so you get big hybridisation problems uh, going out in Scotland at the moment. Um, it's got to the point where they reckon there's only about maybe 30 odd pure wildcats out in the countryside. You'll be able to see that they have got the traits of a bit of stripes down the back. Um, that's general pure wildcat, uh, a nice rounded tail, but it's quite a thin tail. Um, and a thin taper tail, that's a classic sign of domestic cat. Um, and you know, these are little traits that are going to affect whether they're pure or not. But in terms of how they behave, they are certainly wildcats. You know, you don't want to get on the wrong side of these guys. So what is it that we are looking at in here? Well, here we have the pine marten. Pine marten uh, yeah. Now this is our second rarest carnivore, but you know, once upon a time, it's actually our second most common carnivore. Okay. Um, it's evidence suggests that, you know, they were all over the country, um, a woodland specialist, um, and they'd eat pretty much anything, although they specialise in small mammals, so field voles, wood mice, that sort of thing. So what about pine martens in the West Country in Cornwall? Well, once upon a time, there were pine martens here, um, and like the rest of the country, they, you know, they were as I said, very numerous. Um, but it's only really the turn of the 19th century um, that these guys basically eradicated uh, from most of the UK. So if you give the pine martin a chance, if you let it be the animal it's meant to be in Britain, this widespread carnivore that can live anywhere if you, if you allow it to, then we get our pine martins in our cities and our gardens. And it's not just this mythical creature confined to the Caledonian forest, which is the sort of status we hold it in today. Now, throughout history, many of our mammals have suffered persecution, and unfortunately, this effect isn't just limited to land. Some of our birds of prey have also fallen foul. However, Cornish populations of one such raptor have been steadily increasing over recent years. The common buzzard is probably one of Britain's most widespread and visible birds of prey, and around 60,000 pairs are thought to inhabit the English countryside. Pairs tend to mate for life, with males performing ritual aerial displays in early spring to impress their existing mates. Females are generally larger, but despite this, the males are the more proficient hunters and will provide most of the food to the young chicks. Prey consists of rabbit, pheasant, amphibians, snakes, earthworms and large insects. Carrion is also taken, although due to its rather slow flight it rarely takes other prey on the wing. George Swan, who is studying interactions between buzzards and game birds for a PhD with the University of Exeter, sent us footage of some of the prey brought back to the nest for chicks to eat. Prey items range from an eel and a small frog to a shrew and many many moles. 
The chicks are still learning how to tackle live prey, and one mole in particular did not give up. This chick tries to hold on to it, but the mole manages to burrow its way under the nest. Later, we see the same mole, apparently unable to escape the treetop fortress, return to the top of the nest, seemingly unfazed by the chicks, and continues exploring. The young will fledge at around seven weeks, and once they have learnt to fly and efficiently dispatch live prey, they will learn to hunt in a sociable family group with their parents. Hunting buzzards will often be seen hovering in flight, mimicking the kestrel whilst patiently waiting for its prey. The common buzzard is known to suffer from persecution from game preservers, and George Swan's research will add valuable data to this ongoing debate. But on the whole, common buzzards are on the increase across Britain, and this raptor will often be the first bird of prey on any bird watcher's tick list. So that brilliant footage was sent to us by Luke Kerno from the University of Plymouth. And obviously we would love to see more of your footage, so any adventures that you've had over summer or anywhere, please send it in to us. Or to Merseyton in Cornwall, but that is no excuse, the wildlife is still just as common and just as fantastic. So get out there and see it for yourself. See you next time, bye! Goodbye. Bye.